Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Susan Lynch, and my involvement with UCE began over 15 years ago when I first joined Coriolis, our choir. I want to welcome you to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton's online Zoom service. We are a liberal, multi generational religious community. We celebrate a rich mosaic of free thinking spiritually questing individuals joined in common support and action. We welcome a full range of theological perspectives, as well as a full range of spiritual traditions and practices. As a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we strive to be a community where everyone is able to fully participate, regardless of gender, gender expression, race, color, ethnic or national origin, religion, sexual or fictional orientation, age, class, physical character, or disability. Whether you've been a part of our congregation for decades or this is your first time visiting, we welcome you. Whatever the faith and traditions of your past, we welcome you. Whatever your theological stance, we welcome you. Whatever your heritage, we welcome you. Whoever you are and whomever you love, we welcome you, the whole of you. We especially welcome any visitors who might be with us today and invite you to join us for conversation in the breakout rooms once the service has ended. We also invite you to place your name and contact information in our online guest book which you can find on the uce.ca website. Today we are gathered in gratitude on Treaty 6 land. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. As part of that relationship, we're sharing with you the new Indigenous names that have been given to Edmonton's 12 redrawn municipal wards. The names were chosen by a panel of 17 Indigenous women, known as the Committee of Indigenous Matriarchs, and approved by City Council in December of 2020. Today, we share with you Ward 7. The Sipiwiniwak Ward is a southwest edge of Edmonton on the border with the Enoch Cree Nation. Because of their proximity to the North Saskatchewan River, Enoch Cree Nation members were known as the River Cree to the other tribes, which in the Cree language is Sipiwiniwak. The Sipiwiniwak are reclaiming their history through YouTube videos of elders telling short stories about their lives. These stories are their ancient way of entertaining and educating the young about the Enoch Cree Nation values, such as honesty, balance, integrity, commitment, mutual support, and empowerment, all values which we also hold dear. Good morning, I'm Reverend Leanne Washington, the Interim Minister for the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. Today, I will share with you The Human Life Equation, an essay that I published in 2011. I published the essay after I took several years to research what the Bible had to say about a woman's right to reproductive choice, specifically her right to have an abortion. This essay was written to speak to mainline Christians who want to support a woman's reproductive choice, but who feel guilty about it because of what they've been told about the Bible's or God's position on abortion, something like abortion is murder. You will then hear traditional biblical language. I encourage you to make whatever translation is necessary for you to receive today's message. This essay also gives those of us who support a woman's reproductive choice, a way of speaking to mainline Christians using their language and their reference points to assure them that they can still be good Christians while supporting a woman's reproductive choice. 
While researching the Bible's answer to the question, when does life begin? I discovered that there's a human life equation made up of one physical body plus one breath of life plus one spirit of God, which then equals human life according to the Bible. Over and over again, life begins when the human body that is created in the womb takes its first breath, which is likely also the moment when God's spirit enters the body and according to the Bible becomes the human spirit. More on that during today's message. As we ready ourselves for today's service, I draw your attention to Psalm 139, which is meant to be a celebration of God's ever-present protection. It has, unfortunately, become a proof text for those who want to deny women reproductive choice based on what the Bible says. It's possibly the scripture most frequently taken out of context as proof that abortion is murder. It is nonetheless full of beautiful imagery and for theists is a psalm of comfort. The psalmist is never alone. In Psalm 139, he asked the divine, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. I try to count the days, they are more than the sand, and when I come to an end, I am still with you. This picture of God is omnipresent, ever-present, omniscient, all-knowing, and omnipotent, all-powerful, speaks of characteristics of God, not the moral implications of abortion. As we shall discover later this morning, there's a substantial and significant difference between the formation of the body in the womb and the moment when human life begins. As you will see, it's all about the breath. The breath of life. Now, let us take a deep breath a deep breath of life and join in worship. This morning, Kareem Jackson will read to us, let the chalice connect us as we light the chalice. As the chalice is lit, let us come together into sacred space we have created. Let the cares of the day fall away and know that here is a place for quiet reflection. Let a pause in our life for breathing into our true selves. Let what is said and felt here add richness to the dimensions of our life and spiritual practices. We are strong together in community. We share the experience of being human. Let the warmth of the chalice lit during our time together connect us and carry us into the world. With mics muted, please join in singing hymn number 27, 
I am that great and fiery force. I am that great and fiery force, sparkling in everything that lives, and shining up the river's core. Shine and glitter on the sea, in burning sun, in moon and stars, in unseen wind, in verdant trees, I breathe within. Spirit's breath, the thundered word for I am life. I am that great and fiery force, sparkling in everything that lives, and shining up the river's core. An important part of our community is sharing the joys and sorrows of our lives. If you have a personally significant joy or sorrow, please type it into the chat window where we will be able to see it. I will read them aloud. Your joys and sorrows will be part of our posted recording of the service. So if you'd not like to have your joy or sorrow available to the public, then indicate that in the chats with the prefix private. You may also send your joy or sorrow to candles at uce.ca. Tracy lights a candle of joy for her son, Aaron, who's 19 years old and graduated college. And he's also got a great job in his field. Ian Kingdon lights a candle of joy and celebration for his sobriety. Susan lights a candle of sorrow for the 215 remains of children found at a residential school in Conloops. Maria lights a candle of relief and celebration for beginning to better understand the workings of her own brain. She understands that she might get a diagnosis of ADHD and it will be a relief to understand. Yvonne lights a candle of celebration because she was able to visit with her sister for the first time since COVID started. Fergie and Sherry 
light a candle of concern for a father who starts chemo this week for leukemia and a candle of joy that the family has been able to get a second vaccine after having to be on the wait list so long. Reverend Audrey lights a candle of concern and sorrow for the tribal people of Tigray in Ethiopia who are experiencing ethnic cleansing, starvation, and gender violence. David, ha David um, lights a candle of concern for his cousin in England, whose son's long-term girlfriend has been devastated by her brother's suicide. He feels sorrow for her. Please continue as you uh, wish to add joys and sorrows to the chat. We are now going to recognize all the unspoken joys and sorrows held within the sanctuary of our hearts and those who have yet to find a spiritual home where they can share their joys and sorrows. Our meditation this morning is focused on breathing. As you listen, you'll hear a steady chant and a melodic tune. You may want to breathe in and breathe out in rhythm with the chant. Now, please enjoy the First Unitarian Society of Denver's rendition of hymn number 1009, Meditation on Breathing. researching the Bible's answer to the question, when does, <clears throat> when does life begin? I came across a well-known biblical story which depicts the exact moment when human life begins. 
Kareen Jackson will now read the story of the Valley of Dry Bones found in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 4. The Valley of Dry Bones. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out to, by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were many, very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, Oh, Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophecy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I have been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said, prophecy to the breath. Prophecy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole a house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you back from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves. O oh, my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. You're muted, Leanne. Thank you. So this uh, question of when does life begin according to the Bible became something I was interested in after a conversation I had at a coffee house with a good friend of mine who, generally speaking, seemed to be good-hearted, good-natured, uh, fairly socially liberal, but was in some ways conservative, a Republican, and getting more and more involved in public uh, politics. So I had noticed that in those days, this is back in the early, late 1990s, early 2000s, um, that there seemed to be a litmus test for whether or not someone would be accepted to be a Republican candidate. And the litmus test was what their um, position on abortion was. So I discussed this with my friend and I, you know, I asked, well, like, why is this the thing? Why not the, not, why not the preference for a smaller government or why not um, the 
commitment to having decisions, governmental decisions made on a local basis rather than on a federal basis? Why aren't those the litmus test? And his response to me was that for those people who believe that abortion is murder and a violation of God's law, everything else is secondary. So I asked him, how do you know that abortion is murder? And he quoted to me two scriptural verses from the Bible. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And Psalm 139 verse that says, for it was you who formed my inward parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb. You heard uh, Psalm 139 as part of the opening words. So I began doing my own research because uh, I had grown up in the church and been a student of the Bible for a, a number of years. And I just didn't think that those particular scriptures had much, if anything, to do with the question of when does human life begin or the question around morality uh, associated with abortion. So when I looked at Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, I realized that the context in which that verse appears is one completely disassociated with the questions and the argument for which it was being used. It's a situation where Jeremiah, who is a prophet, uh, in the Hebrew scriptures is first being approached by the Holy Spirit, if you will, by God, by a calling, by a notion that he should speak on behalf of the Israel people. He should also be preaching to them, teaching to them a set of morals that were traditionally considered to be coming from God. And uh, he was feeling very insecure and saying, I, I don't speak so well. I don't think on my feet. I think you should try to, you know, get somebody else to do this. And the context is that God is reassuring Jeremiah. According to the scripture, this is what God says. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecra consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. So basically, God's saying, I, you got this. You were made for this. I'm asking you to fulfill your life's purpose, your life's mission. You know, don't feel insecure. You got this. And then in Psalm 139, which you heard, the real focus is not on when does life begin, but on the omniscience, the omnipotence, and the omnipresence of God. Basically, both of these scriptures are pointing to the fact that their understanding of the divine is creative and all-knowing so that God could know that Jeremiah was going to be a prophet before Jeremiah was born. And God could see the process by which the psalmist is being created in his mother's womb because, well... In the Hebrew scriptures, God is God, and God sees and knows everything. There's another scripture that you have seen uh, quoted and used to promote the idea that women's reproductive choice should be, should be limited and that abortion should be outlawed. Um, I know you've seen it in uh, newscasts in the United States, and um, 
It appears on bumper stickers and on websites. And it's just two words. It's choose life. Well, the funny thing about that is that in context, the verse that contains choose life has, again, absolutely nothing to do with when human life begins or with any questions around the termination of human life or abortion or women's reproductive choice. The context for choose life is at the end of Moses's time with the Israelite people, they're getting ready to go into the promised land to the area that is now considered Israel. But this is many, many centuries ago. So Moses brings them, if you recall, from Egypt out of slavery to the promised land, but he's not allowed to go into the promised land. So standing outside the borders, he is teaching them a set of rules, you know, basically creating a civil code for them to live by. And he's a little concerned that they might not be paying attention and that they might hear what he has to say and then not follow the rules. So here's what he says to them. He says, see, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I'm commanding you today, then you will live long and you will prosper in the land that you're getting ready to go into. But if your heart turns away and you don't listen, you go astray and you don't live according to these commandments, then you are likely to perish and not likely to live long in this new land that I am sending you to. He ends by saying, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him, for that means life to you and length of days. And so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give you and to your ancestors. All right, so that's it. Choose life, which really he's saying is choose this set of civil commandments. Choose this way of being in the world and it will bring life and fulfillment to you. Failure to do so, he likens unto death. Really has nothing to do with the question of whether or not it sh abortion should be legal. Now, the Bible doesn't have any direct statements about abortion, but we can infer, we can uh, learn lessons from stories and situations depicted in the Bible that have an underlying assumption built into them. And the underlying assumption is that it's the breath, it's the act of breathing that is what begins and sustains human life. And I was most impressed by the fact that as the uh, Hebrew and Christian Bible got put together for Christian purposes, in the first chapter and the last is the same message, the same illustration of when human life begins. In Genesis, of course, we have the creation of of Adam, and I am well aware that there are multiple creation stories, and I also am aware that there are issues around the creation of womankind, but we're going to put that aside for the moment just to focus on this question of when does human life begin. The scripture says, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. So there you have it. A fully formed body is not yet a living human being. 
It's not until the breath of life, the breath of God, places in some scriptures, the spirit of God enters into the body, the body becomes a living being. Now on the other end in Revelation, there's a story where a group of people or society is being judged for being corrupt. And God sends a couple of witnesses to go and prophesy to the culture and say, look, you've, you know, you're lying, cheating and stealing, you're um, hurting widows and orphans, you're really not living the way I want you to live, and you're hurting each other tremendously. And so what they're doing is trying to convince people to change their ways, to become more compassionate, more kind, more caring of each other. And the message doesn't go over so well, as is not a big surprise. People don't like being judged. So they kill the witnesses. And they're left to lie right where they were killed, out in the open for three and a half days. At the end of that time, the scripture says, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and those who saw them were terrified. So here we have three different stories. We have the creation of Adam, we have the valley of the dry bones, and we have the witnesses in Revelation, all telling the same, or telling different stories, but from the same perspective, that it's really the breath that is the demarcation between living and not living. Now, modern medicine, interestingly enough, agrees in large part with the biblical understanding because lungs are the last major organ to complete their development in the womb. Prior to adequate maturation of the lungs, the body within the womb has no chance of survival outside the womb. Even with lung development sufficient to accept modern medical assistance, there have to be some extraordinary and not always successful measures taken to prepare the lungs to function. In the normal course of events, the body developing in the womb obtains oxygen, oxygen necessary for its cell development from the mother through the umbilical cord and placenta. If prematurely detached from the placental source of oxygen, the developing body ceases to function in the womb and is naturally expelled or in some cases has to be extracted. And if such a body is, uh, such a situation happens and there's a birth and the body never takes a breath, then we call it a stillbirth. And it is a tragedy and a great sadness. While in the womb, the lungs are filled with amniotic fluid, which keeps them developing. And just prior to the birth, when the body goes through the birth canal, that fluid is squeezed out. And when the fetus comes into the new environment outside the womb, it's kind of triggered to take its first breath. Some people think it's because of the difference in temperature. Some people think it's because of the difference between being confined and being free, but whatever it is, everyone in that room, delivery room is holding their breath until they hear the first gasp, the first breath. Now, we've always had the choice whether to become parents. The first option is not to have sexual intercourse. The second option is to use birth control. And birth control has always been available to human beings. Even the ancients were able to take advantage of the withdrawal and cyclical methods of birth control. And they also knew quite a bit about various herbal remedies. The third option is to terminate an unwanted or life-threatening pregnancy. And I could find through several years of looking, no scripture that prohibited these options. 
So to sum up, what's happening in the womb is the creation of the body, a vessel for the human spirit, sustained by the breath of God or the breath of life. So that's the biblical perspective. And so there's nothing moral or right about denying a woman reproductive choice. In fact, one could say exactly the opposite is true, that to trust women and to honor their right to reproductive choice is the moral and just thing to do. There are other scriptures and other perspectives in the essay that I published that I'm unable to share with you in this limited time period. And I'd be happy to talk to you about those things in our time together after the service. In our own Unitarian Universalist tradition, we value faith and learning, and we look to multiple sources to help us understand how the world works and our place in it and how to make meaning from our lives. All too often, we pit faith in a higher power or some spiritual force against current scientific understanding. In the case of the question, when does human life begin? We don't have to pit these two sources for inspiration and knowledge against each other. Faith and science agree. Human life begins with the very first breath. With mics muted, please join in singing hymn number 158, Praise the Source of Faith and Learning.
Generosity is a spiritual practice, one that enlarges the heart and lightens the spirit. For no matter how much or how little we have, in the sharing of it, both the one who gives and the one who receives are blessed. We are a self-governing and self-supporting community. We rely on your donations to support our staff and to offer our programs. Now more than ever, we need your financial support. Please visit our website at uce.ca and click, click on donate in the upper left corner to find the donation method that best suits you. For the month of May, we encourage you to also support, yes, youth empowerment and support services. A new integrated strategy which aims to provide flexible and holistic services to support all young Canadians to help them develop the skills and work experience to successfully transition into the labor market. Please view their website for more information about them. You'll find a link to their website on our church homepage at uce.ca. Now with Mike's muted, please join in singing hymn number 402 from You I Receive. worship service to a close this morning. I thank those who have made our time together possible. Without them, our worship services would not be nearly as robust and meaningful as they are. Susan Rutan, who opened our Zoom room for the service and greeted everyone. Lynn Wolf, who's recording our service today. Sylvia Crow, who will manage our breakout rooms. Ruth Marriott, who's created our slides, is running them this morning, and will post the service on YouTube and SoundCloud. And Susan Lynch and Kareem Jackson are readers. As we close our service today, I share with you a well-known story about King Solomon. Of all the characters in the Bible, he was known for his wealth, his power, and most of all, for his great wisdom. In his reflection on how he became such a person, he coincidentally articulated the biblical understanding that there's a difference between being formed in the womb and actually being alive. The same difference that we've been discussing all morning. He said, I am mortal like everyone else, a descendant of the first formed child of earth. And in the womb of a mother, I was molded into flesh within a period of 10 months. When I was born, I began to breathe the common air and fell upon the kindred earth. My first sound was a cry, as it is true of all. I was nursed with care and swaddling clothes. No king has had a different beginning or existence. There is for all one entrance and one way out. Therefore I prayed and the spirit of wisdom came to me. Now, according to the scripture, this was God's response to Solomon's prayer. Because you have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is truth. Behold, I now do according to your word. I give you a wise and discerning mind. I give you also what you have not asked for, both riches and honor. And if you keep my statutes and my commandments, then I will lengthen your days. And then the scripture says he woke up. For King Solomon spoke to God in his dreams. My prayer this morning for all humankind is that those who are making decisions affecting a woman's right to reproductive choice have Solomon's wisdom and compassion. May they come to understand the importance of women's reproductive choice to women, to their families, and to our society. And may they trust women to make the right choices for themselves and those they love. 
As we bring our time together to a close by extinguishing our chalice, Kareen Jackson will read as Breath to Song, written by Becky Lauren. As flame is to spirit, so spirit is to breath, and breath to song. Though we extinguish the flame in this sanctuary, may it may be tended in our hearts until we meet again. Please join in singing Carry the Flame. concludes our worship service this morning. Please feel free to take a short comfort break, get a cup of coffee, and watch our weekly announcements as they slide by. In a few minutes, you'll be invited into randomly assigned breakout rooms for conversation. You may accept the invitation to join a breakout room, you may decline the invitation, or you may accept the invitation and then when you are ready, return to the main room. I will remain in the main room for about an hour for questions about the service and general discussion.